Hi friends, welcome to the Bible Project Daily Podcast. And the project is to work through the entire Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, over five years. So you're very welcome. Now this is the first time that you've joined us. I'd like to just point out that there is a transcript, copyright free, in the public domain. You can do with it whatever you want. Use it for your own personal private study or for the preparing of any uh, works or teachings of your own but they're there as are all these resources for you to use in whatever way you feel. Uh, the transcript is available and found in the episode notes of any audio version of the podcast so it doesn't matter whether you're using a, a podcast provider like Spotify or Apple Podcasts, one of the big ones or you just use a directory wherever you access the audio version of this podcast you'll find a link there with some chapter breaks and also a transcript uh, which is roughly uh, auto-generated of what I've said. So I hope you find that helpful and useful. If you happen to be watching this, I know there's a few of you, only a few compared to the thousands who listen online, but if you're watching this on uh, Facebook or YouTube, then there's a link there through to the audio version of the podcast which is hosted on buzzsprout.com and that's where you'll find not only the uh, the transcript but also links to, and other ways you can connect to my teaching and my ministry but anyway that's it for today uh, we're about to launch off on the second part of this uh, this journey looking at what happens to Joseph when he's uh, dragged out of prison and brought before Pharaoh so I hope you find it helpful and I'll we'll bob into the main text now and I'll just catch up with you again at the end. Bye for now. Okay, friends, we're back here in day two of the three days we're going to spend uh, working through Genesis chapter 41, looking at the situation where Joseph has been plucked from prison and brought before Pharaoh, who's been troubled by these dreams. Now, I'd just like to remind us of where we are in the text that we, where we finished off last time. So I'll just read the few verses that we closed off last time with, beginning in Genesis chapter 41, verse 9, which tells us, Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us giving each man the interpretation of his dreams. And the thing turned out exactly as he had interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. So we're at the point where the butler speaks up, and he says to Pharaoh, Remember my faults. Now, as a matter of fact, that's the opening phrase of what he's about to say. And the word translated fault actually really means sins. So in a sense, he's confessing to Pharaoh that whatever he was accused of, he was probably guilty of. Now, apparently, it would seem he didn't do anything that was worthy of capital punishment, but it appears the baker did. Now, I think it's interesting that he starts out by saying to Pharaoh, Look, I can see that I sinned, and I remember that you put me in custody on the prison uh, under the captain of the guard and that you put both me and the chief baker. So he's acknowledging, in a sense, that he had done something wrong, and that's why he was put into prison. And then he goes on and says, each of us had a dream in prison on, on one evening, but he, he recalls that there was a young Hebrew man in there, a servant, in fact, of the captain of the guard, Potiphar, and that he interpreted their dreams to each of us. He, and he interpreted each of our dreams differently, he tells Pharaoh. And he says, things came to pass just as he had said they would. Because he said he, he, that I would be to restored to my role serving you, but he also said that you would execute the baker. And that's what you did. Pharaoh had done exactly 
as, as Joseph had interpreted. So the cupbearer now tells Pharaoh this, and he says, look, I just happened to meet this guy in jail, but he might be of servant to you, be of service to you. Now, maybe the delay in causing Joseph to mind was because the cupbearer really just wanted to forget about that part of his life. Anyway, let's pick up the story again in verse 14, which tells us this. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had, he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. All right, notice at the start of this section, it says quickly Pharaoh commands them to bring Joseph to him. So there's an urgency here. Now, no doubt Joseph was in a bit of a state, having been in prison for a long time, probably dressed in shabby prison clothes at this point. So he is shaved and dressed before being brought before Pharaoh. And then Pharaoh says to him, look, this is very straightforward, Joseph. I've had a dream and they say you can interpret it. What's, what do you say? What do you claim? Now notice carefully what Joseph's answer is. He says, God can give an answer, not him. In other words, he says, look, I cannot take credit for any of this. God has given you the vision. He's given you the dream, Pharaoh, and God will also give you the answer. So Joseph is immediately pointing to the Lord in all that is going on here. So verse 17 then says, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. So we do know it's the Nile River, which we didn't know that detail first time round. When out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I have never seen such ugly cows in the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. And then I woke up. So basically here, Pharaoh is telling the same story he has told previously to everyone. But this time we see, uh, we find a few more details that aren't recorded in the first version of the dream that we heard. Namely, instead of just saying the cows were ugly, he says that they're very ugly. And he also adds that he's never seen cows like this in his life before, saying that they were the ugliest thing he had ever seen in his life. And this fact that, that, the, that after they'd eaten the, uh, the healthy cows, that they looked no better. So, But basically, it's the same dream with a few little added minor details. Let's carry on in verse 22. In my dream I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk, and after them seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin head, heads of grain swallowed up the seven goods heads. I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. So there's not really a whole lot of different information here. He's just retelling the content of his two dreams to Joseph. That's all that's happening. He says seven cows and seven heads of grain, which the number seven here is the significant part of the dream. Verse 25 then tells us, Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that come up afterwards are another seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east winds. They both represent the seven years of famine. So Joseph is saying, you've had two dreams, one about cows, one about crops, but this is still one dream with one narrative in that sense. It all means the same thing. And God here is showing Pharaoh what is about to happen. That's what he tells him. So Joseph is saying the two dreams both involve seven years. And that's the important point here. 
there's only one and the same uh, point to both these different dreams and it has to do primarily with the number seven representing seven years the seven cows represent seven years and the seven heads of grain the full heads of grain represent the same seven years and the seven thin cows and the seven thin heads of grain represent another seven years which is seven years of famine so Joseph is telling Pharaoh that through these dreams God has shown Pharaoh exactly what is about to happen in the land of Egypt. Seven years of great plenty are about to come upon the land but after that there will be seven years of famine and that they will, there, there will be the, any years of greatness will pretty much be forgotten in the land of Egypt if no action is taken because the famine will completely deplete and destroy the land so in other words planning must take place because of the famine that is going to follow the years of plenty the famine will be very severe and the reason uh, Joseph says the dream is repeated to Pharaoh twice was because God wants to signal to him that these things are firmly established and God will shortly bring it to pass so the explanation is very simple it's that there's going to be seven years of, of plenty followed by seven years of famine. Now let's see if we can uh, just hop, skip and a jump through the, the, the rest of, the, of this, uh, this passage, summarizing as we go. So picking up in verse 28, as I've just said, it is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So this is Joseph speaking. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance of the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that this matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. So we're going, he's saying we're going to need, you're going to need, Pharaoh, seven years of planning during this time of plenty to try and offset the effects of the seven years of famine that will follow on. And God has told him and given him his dream twice, in a sense to make doubly sure that Pharaoh knows that this is going to happen and it's going to happen soon. So that's the dream and that's the interpretation. That's what God is about to do. He's about to give you seven years of plenty, Pharaoh, followed by seven years of extreme fa famine. Okay, we're about halfway through the chapter here, so we'll just crack on with the narrative. And, and it tells us, And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man, and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming up and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his official, officials. So... There's a sense of here we need to gather in spring and summer, make hay while the sun shines, but store up for the winter. Now what's really important here is the concept of sacrificing the today for a better tomorrow is shown here again in the book of Genesis, a concept which many Bible experts believe was first introduced into human consciousness by these stories found within the earliest books of the Bible, just like here in Genesis. And this is really important because out of this concept of putting aside today for the hope of a better tomorrow flow ideas like, well, the development of currency, the concept of investing and saving money or resources for a so-called rainy day in the future. So it's really significant that way back here in Genesis chapter 41, Joseph is introducing this concept here. And Joseph is also saying to Pharaoh that he needs to look for a wise and a discerning man to help him deal with the approaching time of, of hardship. 
and he not only describes the problem but he describes the basic bare bones of the process that would be needed to put in place to try and offset the sacrifice that will be needed now to make uh, to bring about deliverance for the land in the future and pharaoh listens and hears and sees it as good advice and it's not only seen to be good advice in the eyes of pharaoh but also his servants as well you know those uh that his entourage around him the story continues in verse 38 so pharaoh asked him and he's also speaking to of course his his uh, people around him at the same time can we find anyone like this man one in whom is the spirit of god then pharaoh said to joseph since god has made all this known to you there is no one so discerning and wise as you you shall be in charge of my palace and all of my people are to submit to your orders only with respect to the throne throne will i be greater than you so pharaoh he refers to the servants and says where are we going to find such a man as this now it's interesting to me that pharaoh not only recognizes that joseph had wisdom but he also recognizes that his wisdom, uh, well, he attributes it to Joseph's relationship with God. He says, a man in whom is the spirit of God. I think what he's recognizing is that Joseph was a wise person, yes, but what he had was a godly wisdom. The story continues. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, Make way. Doesn't that remind you of the dream that he had with his brothers? Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all of Egypt. So Pharaoh has put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt and tells him that without his consent, no one can lift a hand or a foot in the land. No one could do anything without his permission. This means that he doesn't just get appointed to some ancient version of a minister of agriculture. Pharaoh has actually made him vice president, if you like, deputy prime minister in the whole land of egypt the only person who will be more powerful to him in the land will be pharaoh the king himself and everyone is going to have to bow their knees to him that's a throwback to his his first dream that he gave to his brothers isn't it and also the sign of his authority will be signaled from the fact that he's given him a signet ring and a gold chain to put around his neck and he also gives him a robe and a royal chariot to ride in. So here we have a young man, Joseph, who's gone from being prisoner to vice president in an afternoon. And it all happened just because two years previously he met someone in jail. In fact, it only happened because he met the cupbearer while serving time in jail and was able to use his God, express his God-given gift, to interpret that man's dream that all of these things have come to pass something which i would suggest probably at the time was seemed a fairly minor event in the life of joseph has meant that all these amazing things have come to pass and happened to him later vice president overnight he spent two years languishing in jail and then bam all of a sudden he's promoted to second in command in all of the land of Egypt. Wow, what an amazing turn of events. Well, we leave it there for today and we'll close out this uh, final section of this chapter 41 when we come back together again next time. Bye for now. Okay, friends, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Quick reminder that the links and all the ways of connecting with me, my ministry, uh, extra resources, teaching material are all available. The links to the episode notes of any audio version of the podcast. Included in there are links to the Patreon page, which is where 
I put uh, exclusive other teaching material, long format teaching material, talks that I've given as guest speakers in other churches or even on occasion when I do talks in secular environments. There are real opportunities there, particularly coming in September, opportunities of more discipleship course type teaching where I want to try and help people who are part of this daily Bible project community to develop their giftings themselves and to serve within their local church in the areas of Bible study and Bible teaching. But all that material is available, uh, will be available only through the Patreon page. By linking in there and perhaps even becoming a patron and supporting this work, you're not only enabling the Daily Bible Project podcast to go on the internet for free, but to stay on the internet. Another really helpful thing you can do is uh, to support this ministry. But first of all, is pray for, for me and pray for it that I may be given the time and the good help to continue to work through this amazing five year project to completion. But also, if you're a user of social media, maybe consider liking it, uh, reviewing it, sharing it, so that this teaching can be made and be seen more widely available uh, on, on wherever you happen to inhabit the particular corners of the internet that you inhabit. And if you want to make sure you receive the podcast every day, then I recommend that you subscribe to it on whatever, wherever you get your podcasts from. But anyway, that's it for today. I hope you're enjoying being part of this family of people who have grabbed the opportunity to not just read the Bible, but to be to study the Bible day by day, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the entire Bible. So I really hope you're benefiting, as I am, from making Bible study part of the rhythm of your daily lives. But anyway, that's it for today. I'll be back here again tomorrow, or whatever day it happens to be for you, when you do your catch-up on your podcast. I really thank you for joining me and I'll see you right back here tomorrow on the Bible Project Daily Podcast. Bye-bye for now.